Okay, greetings everyone and happy Earth Day. Um, I am here with a wonderful panel. Um, and today our topic is going to be farm to table, eating our way to a healthier planet. Um, so welcome ladies um, to Earth Day and to Earth Day Burks 2021. We're really happy to have you here. This is our, our, our maiden voyage for our first legit live event of this of this whole virtual realm here for Earth Day. So we're really happy to have you. Um, I wanna start off by just um, introducing everybody. Um, so first off, um, I will tell you a little bit about Pam. So in, uh, in 2009, Pam Ellenberger left the world of allopathic medicine to begin her farming journey. She and her husband were fortunate to find 55 acres uh, right here in Shoemakersville to house the alpacas, angora rabbits and chickens. After reading The Omnivore, Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan and many of Joel Sladden's uh, books, Pam's direction has undergone a metamorphosis from a fiber-centric farm to one focusing on raising quality, nutrient-dense proteins for the local market. Taking care of animals with herbs, essential oils, and GMO-free feed lets Pam aim for healthy animals with robust immune systems. An integrative approach that is flexible to use medicine if these fail promotes animal welfare on the farm. As a former physician, Pam believes that our health and the health of our neighbors, plus the larger community, is linked to the agricultural world as it moves from sustainability to regenerative. She also believes that the individual has more power than they realize to affect change for their health and the health of the planet. Um, thank you so much for being here, Pam. We're really glad to have you. Thank you. Um, we also have Michelle Mart with us today, um, who is the author of Pesticides, A Love Story, America's Embrace of Dangerous Chemicals. Uh, she is a cultural historian currently working on a history of food, culture, and the environment in recent American history and teaches history at Penn State Parks. Thanks so much for being here today, Michelle. Thanks for having me. And then last but certainly not least, uh, we have Lucene Sahelnik, and I'm really happy to have you here too, Lucene. So Luc Councilwoman Lucene Sahelnik brings together sustainable facets of community and economic development. She believes that through true collaboration, Reading's community stakeholders will improve our city with a united vision. Through efforts like increasing access to healthy food, improving community health, and making neighborhoods uh, more livable, we improve our quality of life. Lucene works hard to make sure that the residents of her district and of Greater Reading feel that their voices are heard. Lucene has served as a change agent and socioeconomic broker for many community programs and initiatives, connecting residents, city administration, its authorities, boards, and commissions, as well as city council local business and nonprofit organizations. Through efforts as a diverse and uh, as teaching yoga to serve on local board of directors, to serve as district one's city councilwoman, she brings diverse experience in leadership, sustainability, people, places and profit and food systems to um, her efforts of improving Greater Reading and Berks County. For Lucene, um, cross-sector collaboration is key to success and that residents and local business owners uh, are our community's most important stakeholders. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, Lucene. Um, so just a little bit of what to expect um, during this panel. Um, you know, we have some really different perspectives here, but everyone here is uh, like-minded when it comes to how important the issue of what we choose um, and are able to eat um, can impact our environment. So really we wanted to get a little bit of a different kind of comprehensive approach to this topic um, to have these ladies share their perspectives um, and uh, how that connection, that very strong connection um, to what we eat can actually lead to a, a healthier planet. Um, so I will start off um, with kind of the actual, we'll start off on the farm. So talking from an environmental perspective, Pam, can you talk a little bit about your farm and um, how, you know, what sustainability means to you at Bentlin? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, we started the farm with 
just alpacas and um, angora rabbits and a few chickens and have progressed now that we have goats and sheep and lots and lots of pigs. And they each one do a different thing on the farm. So by improving the land, um, we've able to increase in insects and songbirds, none of which were here when we bought the property. And the soil, when we first moved here, in order to put in our portable fences, we actually had to drill with the masonry bit to make the holes in the ground. And now in most places we can step in the pet, the prongs. So that helps the land by using the animals to not let them overgraze, collect their manure, compost that manure so that um, the parasite load goes down. And then we actually put that back onto the fields and by using compost as opposed to chemical fertilizer, we are increasing the biome, the, all the mycorrhizomes and the bacteria and the earthworms and everything that helps make the soil better so that we can capture more sunshine, grow more plants and better feed the animals. Um, we only use non-genetically modified feed in an attempt to decrease the amount of pesticides or insecticides that are fed to our animals. Um, again, to have their manure be healthier so that it makes the land healthier. So by controlling the animal's movement and letting the pigs root it up and then we reseed behind them or the alpacas eat it down a little bit and then let the grass regrow, um, we've actually seen that it can make the land healthier and better. I mean, just looking out over the pastures where before you could see bare spots everywhere. Now we have green that covers over with fewer, we're not perfect yet, but we still, so we still have fewer bare spots, but we um, continue to, that's our goal is to have it be not just sustainable because sustainable means that you're just gonna stay at the same level we want it to be better whenever we move on to get too old to be a farmer anymore. Right, we've really been hearing um, the word regenerative being used a lot more, right? And I think that's why, because if you, it, there is no company in America that wants to sustain itself, they wanna get better. And I think agriculture um, not, necessarily conventional agriculture, um, the monocrop agriculture, but there are people out there like Zach Bush who are really pushing for regenerative agriculture to be a big thing. Like he's looking for 5 million acres in the Midwest to not just be the same as it was or keeping it the same, but actually reclaiming it and making it better. So sometimes um, meat gets a bad rap when we talk about re regenerative and sustainable agriculture. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about the spectrum of quality when it comes to meat and kind of maybe debunking some of that um, negativity when it comes um, to this topic? Yeah, I, I, I don't have cows um, yet for meat. Um, everything on the farm is for protein, whether it's the fiber or their eggs or the meat of the animals. Um, and the animals can take the grass or in the case of the goats, they'll eat my poison ivy, which is why I got goats in the first place. Um, and they convert that into high quality protein. Plus they sort of process the vitamins and minerals in the plants. It goes, some of that goes into their manure, which then can go back into the land. Um, so, I mean, I haven't gone to the grocery store to buy meat for a long time, partly because I can't uh, um, be part of how they raise the animals. Um, it's, Temple Grandin is a, a really cool lady who's a PhD autistic animal behaviorist. And 
she believes that if we're going to eat meat, um, the animals should be raised humanely. Um, and I've read a, a lot of her stuff and try to do that with the animals. They get, you know, our pigs are born outside. They live their entire life outside in, on grass or in the woods or in the hedgerows. Um, right now, a bunch of them are under our solar panels, cleaning that out for us. Um, and we also try to minimize stress when it's time to go to butcher. So in trying to honor sort of the animal, and I also try to use all of the animal. If we're going to go that route, um, the animals aren't pushed and shoved to get into the trailers. We actually put the trailer in the pasture and feed them in the trailer. They go in and out, they sleep in the trailer. So it's not a scary place for them. Yes, it's a bad day when they have to go to butcher or when they get processed, but um, that also is part of sort of the circle of life. Mm -hmm. So that their high quality protein then feeds the people who come and support my farm and appreciate the way the animals are raised. Yeah, it's that personal choice of the consumer, which we will get back to. Um, okay. But thank you for sharing a little bit about the farm. And um, I'm sure you'll be able to pepper in some other really great details as we go along. Um, but I'll, I'll move over to Michelle. Um, so from her perspective, we'll, we'll go a little into cultural and historic. Um, so Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about um, you know, kind of your background in relation to, to this topic? And um, you know, as far as food culture uh, and how it's changed over the years for, for us here in America? Um, as, as Pam was talking, I was thinking a lot about the, the background that I wanted inject because the majority of us do not eat the kind of high quality meat that's coming off of Pam's farm. And so I think it's important to think about how we got to where we are now mm -hmm. and different cracks in the system, um, not just Pam's farm, other farms and other uh, food activists who are trying to dismantle some of the bad things with our food system um, and, and rebuild something better. I, I do think it's also important to acknowledge that I'll say right at the beginning that our food system does have good things in it. It is not a total disaster. <laughs> and the most important good thing in our food system, the most prominent um, uh, good outcome is abundance. So in the United States and in a number of other countries, the idea of having sufficient food is not the central question. And for most of human history, amounts and abundance has been in, in uh, question. And so this is a great thing. Having said that, there are also disastrous things about our <laughs> food system. So let me just briefly sketch out a couple of ways that we got to where we are. Um, one of the things which is, I think, important to talk about, and I'm just gonna talk about from the 20th century onwards, um, is that by the early to mid 20th century in the United States, we had way fewer people living on farms and producing food. Now, there, there's a good aspect to that in that some people chose not to live on farms and produce food and they did other things, they made other choices. Um, but I think one of the problems that starts at the early 20th century is that you start to see this split between people, all of us eaters and who is producing our food. And I think over the century, we have less and less feeling of connection and understanding with um, the earth, with the animals, with the producers. And food becomes really divorced from the earth. And 
today on Earth Day, I think this is kind of a central focus that we need to think about is how food connects us to the Earth. Um, so early to mid 20th century, fewer people producing food, uh, fewer people living on farms, and you start to see a big increase in packaged goods, packaged foods, and an increase in supermarkets, and an increase in the government of the United States um, talking about food only in nutritional terms. So giving lots of advice to people, eat this because it's got this vitamin, eat that because it's got that vitamin, but let's talk about whole foods um, by themselves. After World War II, then there's an explosion of packaged goods, mass produced goods, industrial foods. Um, and people, more and more people uh, are going to the supermarket to buy packaged foods and fewer and fewer people are producing that food. Um, and people would get packaged products and combine them together to make some unusual or fancy dish that they thought my favorite example of this from, from the post-war period is this cookbook called the Can Opener Cookbook. And it advised people to just go and open up cans and stick them all together. <laughs> and you make this great voila uh, meal. <laughs> um, by the 1960s and 70s, there's already dissatisfaction that's mm -hmm. rising, even though this is how most of us eat our, get our food, eat our food. Um, one, you start to see some people who are saying, yeah, this, this food doesn't taste very good. I, you know, I want something better. And they're looking for finer food or more authentic food. And the first person who comes to mind for this is Julia Child. And she gets really famous with mastering the art of French cooking. And all of a sudden people say, wow, I could make food like that. Um, so that's, that's one trajectory. Another development that you start to see in the late 60s and 70s are people who start to question this, this um, uh, divorce between food and the environment. And they start looking at a lot of the waste within the industrial food system uh, and what that means globally. And the most important example of this, this view is Francis Moore LePay, uh, who wrote Diet for a Small Planet. Um, by the time we get to the 80s and the 90s, there are a lot of um, people who had dissatisfaction with our food system for additional reasons. Um, one, nutritionists are linking all of these bad health outcomes mm -hmm. with our bad food. Um, so you get someone like Marion Nessel, who becomes this really famous nutritionist outside of the university as well, who is making this connection. Um, and then you also get other people who are making the environmental connection more and thinking about connection to the land, connection to the community, connection to your locality, and then the person that comes to mind uh, in this regard is Alice Waters, yes. uh, who's an activist and restaurateur. And she inspires a lot of other people to think about local food and getting connected to your uh, farmers. Um, so I could, that's, that's my brief historical nope, that's sketch. That's fantastic. Century, you touched on a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we came a long a way. That a was a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I, I don't know if you want to uh, jump to Lucene if sure. we're thinking about connection to community and then there are some other, you know, I yeah. think hugely important issues to talk about when we're thinking about local, what's yes. local and what's not. We have those questions coming up. So thank you so much for that. That was a great journey you just took us on. So thank you for that. Uh, and then uh, we'll jump to Lucene. So Lucene, I know that this is a topic that's near and dear to your heart. Um, and I would love to hear kind of your perspective in the work that you do in, in Reading and beyond and some of the kind of um, 
framework that you've really been building for quite a long time in this area, um, you know, both uh, for economic development and for um, advocacy of local agriculture. So please take it away. Thank you. Um, it's great to go after Pam and Michelle because I think they set it up so beautifully um, because when we talk talk about you know, economic development and the urban environment, it may seem that it could be possibly very disconnected um, from you know, uh, our, our, our farms you know, and our rural um, area and uh, local foods and, and understanding that system. Um, so my, my piece and my segment here really is kind of taking that trip from rural to urban um, in the component of farm to table. And I've done it personally. So, you know, I, I'm always pleased to be able to speak um, towards, you know, what I've been able to experience myself um, and the, the, really the journey um, to, to bring it all together and really, you know, the, the collaboration of all these pieces and, and how they do come together um, is uh, over a decade ago, um, I had uh, just finished my master's degree at Alvernia, and um, one of the, the projects and outcomes of that was a uh, purchase of a three and a half acre um, farmette uh, up in, in Upper Burn Township um, to really take the theory of some of what's already been discussed um, in terms of sustainability, sustainable agriculture, um, local food systems, uh, and put it into practice. Um, and so, start out as a grower uh, and, you know, using um, sustainable methods, um, non-certified uh, organic growing of what you would call your, your typical like kitchen summer seasonal garden, um, you know, but on a larger scale so that, um, you know, I was able to take that um, and bring it to restaurants um, in our urban core, uh, like West Reading. Um, so restaurants that don't exist anymore, sadly, like Good Eats, um, but uh, also restaurants like Say Cheese, which are still um, thriving, you know, and the ability to connect some of that locally grown, you know, less than 20 miles outside of, of the core there um, of, the, of the city um, with the, the that uh, materials, you know, um, that you know, were pesticide free, you know, they were GMO um, free, um, you know, from the seed and the soil, you know, and, and starting with, with your principles, ensuring um, that again, you know, this is a high quality nutrient dense product, um, bringing it then to be featured uh, and I mean featured, you know, on seasonal menus um, with fresh, you know, eggs right there um, next to the chef station um, to, to um, be creating these beautiful omelets that people are ordering off the menu with whatever kind of cheese you could imagine, right, um, is, is the first part of the story. Um, but as you start to um, take the perspective of the grower, which I think Pam, you know, has so much to speak towards on that, um, or, you know, working with the animals, you know, um, whether it's the proteins, you know, or, or the cheeses or the eggs or, you know, um, you know, the journey. So the part of the journey coming in then to these local restaurants um, and, and you start to see also, um, what's happening in the urban core a little bit deeper, you know, in the city of Reading. Um, so from West Reading and working with those restaurants, um, I was able to take on, um, I guess, the, the revitalization of the Penn Street Market in, in downtown Reading, uh, you know, and so uh, at the time there was the danger of that market closing and there not being any seasonal, you know, community producer-based um, garden, uh, or I'm sorry, farmer's market in the city of Reading, which to me was terrifying, Absolutely. you know, coming from a place where, you know, probably a hundred of 200 years ago, um, there was a market haven in Reading, you know, there were market houses, several of them in, in the middle of Penn Square, uh, you know, there were prominent market houses in the south side of the city, prominent market houses where people did all their shopping, you know, whether there was live animals or produce or cheese or whatever you needed. Um, so for that to completely disappear, um, you know, was, <sighs> I'm not sure the right word for it, um, but I think everybody, you know, listening or participating can feel what that might have felt like in terms of this can't go away. 
Um, to be able to take in that role and start to look at, uh, in the city of Reading, what food access looks like. Um, so now we're talking about when Michelle says, you know, we had this push to prepackage a lot of packaged foods, a lot of shelf stable items and cans, um, you're starting to lose on your um, nutrition. Um, okay. And you're starting to, of course, feel that disconnection that she, you know, she was talking about. Uh, and, you know, the lack of access to fresh food. Um, and, you know, ironically, there are farms and, and orchards, you know, less than 10 miles from, from the radius of, of the city of Reading, but there were barriers um, in terms of getting that food, uh, you know, that's being grown and cultivated all around us to the people or to some of the most vulnerable populations like our children and, and our seniors or older adults. Uh, so really, you know, I think that's where um, the advocacy has developed for me personally. So when I speak today um, on behalf of, you know, city council or the roles, you know, in community economic development, I don't think it's so far fetched or removed from the, the pure conversation that we're having, which is, you know, farm to table and eating our way to a healthier planet. I, I firmly believe that all of these pieces are, are connected um, to each other um, and they rely on each other. And so uh, I've been able to take uh, the work that I started with in actually growing myself um, to really coming into a role where it's more policy-based um, and uh, really a collective impact approach to how do we work with our, um, you know, stakeholders, as I said earlier, you know, who are not receiving access to uh, this food that we, we need. And a lot of times probably is more affordable. Um, we know that it's more nutritious. Um, but along with that comes a mixed bag. Uh, and I'm sure we're probably gonna get into some of that conversation um, a little bit later. I'm also excited to talk about where we are currently in the state of the city um, and you know, access to food, food deserts, um, and great projects that are happening, um, especially some that have been announced this week in celebration of Earth Week and Earth Day. Uh, so I look forward to that as, as we continue our conversation today and ask some really good questions and dialogue. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Lucine. Um, so do, do you ladies think, um, you know, we talked about this disconnect, which obviously is still present amongst, you know, the majority of the population, but do you feel in, you know, the last few years, and especially this past year that we've gone through, um, do you think there is a shift in consciousness that's happening, maybe a shift in values? Do you guys want to speak to that a little bit? Anybody can jump in that feels moved. I don't wanna be um, pessimistic at the outset of your question, but no problem. <laughs> um, I, 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 um, I don't feel, I, I, I am hoping that our momentum increases in this regard. I feel like we have as I, I was using the description cracks in the system. And I feel like we have um, shoots coming through the cracks, growing through the cracks, but uh, it really is very limited at the moment. And um, so in the United States, for example, 4% of all the agriculture is organic, which is really limited. And that 4% is, not necessarily local organic, community organic, but industrial organic. And then uh, one other statistic to kind of put this push in perspective is that 2% of um, uh, the world's food that feeds people is organic. So that's, this is still really small. If, if we're using organic as one way of talking about an alternative to the industrial food system. And again, as I said, that's not the same as local. So there's organic, there's local, and sometimes they coincide and sometimes they don't. Um, so I, I think we really need to change people's expectations about food, about the food system, about their access to food Absolutely. and about the cost of food. 
And if we can chip away at that, then I think we can start to um, shift the system more. Uh, but, but right now people have a norm in their head about how to measure food and they want to get whatever food they want whenever they want. We're so used to that. Yeah, that just going to the grocery store and buying a mango, you know, in the middle of winter or strawberries. Yep, go ahead, Lucene. So I think that the pandemic has actually done an interesting job of fracturing uh, our reliance on what we thought was a very circular and strong food system um, in that now we've seen those who can get past the barriers of transportation or cost uh, not having what they typically have a reliance on the shelves um, so, uh, you know, if you look past seasonal eating, um, you know, my son is very disappointed at the age of three that he cannot have his strawberries year round. You know, he has yet to understand and work through the concept of, well, let's talk about it, even though we do go to local orchards, you know, and, and say, oh, you know, seasonally, if we're accessing these things, then, you know, we start to have that level of expectation and understanding, um, whereas a majority, and I, 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 I don't have that statistic, but you know, are, are reliant on being able to go to your grocery store, whatever it might be, and get anything that you want, any time of the year, um, have the ability and the means to pay for that. Um, and again, you know, making those decisions for, for yourself, what is most important for me today? You know, is it most important for me to eat locally? Is it most important for me to eat organically? Is it most important for me to have a modified diet that doesn't include certain items? Um, is it most important for me to eat today? Period. You know, so I think the pandemic has been able to bring some of that forward in our considerations where now the majority who are able to access their food at all times and eat whatever, however they want to, don't have that. And so we start, I think that really started this great paradigm shift back to the local food movement, um, where I think, you know, in terms of what Pam's talking about, I think people started to make those connections again. They started to look for and seek out their local farmers um, and, you know, use their dollars to support um, locally grown products. And then, you know, philosophically now are making that connection. It's starting to climb a little bit higher in their decision making process of what's most important to them and, and what they're eating and why they're eating it. And you guys kind of naturally migrated to my next question. Michelle touched on it, kind of covering a couple of things. The question of, you know, why do people choose to eat what they eat? And then also why do they choose to change what they eat? Um, Pam, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the relationships you have with kind of your regulars and you know why, why they decide to come back to you again and again to get that high quality meat rather than going to the grocery store. Um, could, could I just add a question for Pam too as she's sure. answering your question? And that is that um, I'm really curious if what Lucine was just saying regarding her observations of the pandemic, how that's played out on your farm yep. and whether or not you've seen a difference in your relationship with customers or local people or anything else during the pandemic, or have you, have you kind of been removed from that? Um, it's interesting. And if you talk to other farmers um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, when there were shortages and they couldn't get whatever meat they wanted at the grocery store, all of a sudden cases were empty. Mm -hmm. We, uh, the, the group that I talked to, we all saw a blip where people were calling local farms. Um, you couldn't buy a freezer. People yeah. were buying freezers of any size to try to get some kind of um, meat or frozen vegetables or some kind of food that they had in their house to feel secure. Um, that blip has gone away. Um, I still have some people who come back that mm -hmm. came to me because of the blip. Um, but I don't think it's been what we could call a big paradigm shift. And the people that, I mean, <sighs> What I wish that people understood was how the farmers appreciate the people that support us. 
I have families that come and they buy their meat from me once a month. They come, they get their stuff, they walk around, they see how I raise the animals, they ask me about the feed that I do. I have feed bags that they can look at their content. Mm -hmm. Everything on my farm, I just let people take, I say you can walk anywhere, you can take pictures of anything, I don't care. Um, and they see where my animals are. They see that when they come back next month, everybody's moved. They can't find them where they were before because they're on fresh grass. Um, so I have people who come because of the quality. It tastes better. And if you have the opportunity to grow your own, like Lucene did, you know that it tastes better than the stuff that got shipped from California. Um, and there is some benefit to eating seasonally. And knowing that the eggs that you get from the chickens in January are different than the eggs you get when they're on grass in June. They look different, they taste different. Um, so those, the, and then there are people who just like it because it, they know how I raise them for what they eat and how they're processed. That they're not poked and prodded. There's no electric prods where I take them. I mean, I've looked at where they go to know that they're not abused before they're dispatched. Um, so you have people who are becoming, you have some people who are aware and really care about sort of the background. They don't want it to be where, you know, some poor migrant worker who is not even making minimum wage grew their, you know, had harvested their food because they don't want him to be abused either. Um, but I don't think that that blip that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic has continued because now the grocery store shelves are full again. Yeah. So people, and, and it's harder to eat the way the families that come to me eat. They have to actually come to the farm. It's more conscious, right? It's more, you know, there's more of an intention there. Right. And they, and it's not as convenient, right. as, you know, they can, they can call me, I can have their order ready but they still have to come. come it. It's not like they go to Walmart and they can get everything all in one place. You know, um, I have belonged to a CSA that's four miles down the road, but I actually have to put a reminder on my phone to the alarm goes off and I have to go get my vegetables. To me, it's worth it because I think they taste better and they're seasonal, um, but I'm not sure how you get people to appreciate that to make up for the inconvenience. Right. So I want to um, just remind if there's anyone watching on Facebook, please, if you have questions, uh, we have Risa here. Thank you, Risa, for joining us to screen some of these questions. So please don't be shy. Have some questions. I do want to shift to the other end of the spectrum from that last question and go back to Lucene. And, you know, you touched on it, but what if you don't have the luxury to go to Pam and go get some really high quality meat? What if you're not even sure where your next meal is coming from? So mm -hmm. let's, if you could touch on a little bit of um, the food, food insecurity, um, maybe specifically to your experience, you know, in downtown Reading and, and um, what that looks like and maybe how that's being addressed in the city. Yeah, the, you know, you talk about convenience and what's convenient for most who are relying on walking or biking to get where they need to, to get their food um, is at the corner store. And, you know, if I pull most people, you know, at least on, on this panel, uh, you know, what are you gonna find at a corner store? Um, unfortunately here in, in the city of Reading predominantly, uh, we don't have a lot of fresh foods, um, fruits and vegetables, you know, and nutrient dense meats and milks. And, you know, that's not what you're seeing in terms of what's convenient or accessible. Um, in addition, there is a high poverty rate. And so what happens there is you are budgeting um, very closely, uh, or I should say, you know, there's probably a need to if you can. Um, there is a lot of um, support from um, government um, programming uh, in terms of your supplemental nutrition access programs. Uh, and your supplementary uh, checks, you know, that can be received for our senior populations, 
for expecting um, or new mothers from the women, infants and children's offices uh, that really do provide a lot of assistance for food purchasing. Um, and you know, some of them uh, are coupled um, in really creative ways with incentive programs. So let's shift from convenience of, you know, a corner store um, when you have a lack of access to healthy and nutritious food, that is what defines a food desert. And there are many areas in the city of Reading that, you know, fall into that designation. So we have to bring the food in. That's where projects like the Penn Street Market, which, you know, yeah, Courtney right now is spirit heading and is the champion of um, are integral, um, not only because it creates a food hub, it, it creates and sets up an access point where otherwise there are none. Um, what I think is most um, beautiful about uh, the, the ability is if you find yourself limited on how to um, purchase, you know, this food that is not commonly accessible to you um, or not frozen or canned or shelf stable, um, there are incentive programs uh, that have been created to further enhance your purchasing power for those items like fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so at the Penn Street Market and beyond, we see this at some of the corner stores now. We see this at the year-round uh, Fairgrounds Farmers Market, which is just outside of the city limits of Reading, um, and also pop-up uh, farmer stands that have been taking place at some of our elementary schools um, throughout the city. Uh, they are, it's, it's a program called Burke's Farm Bucks and it is a, a, a privately funded incentive based program. If you come to the market uh, with those uh, previous um, programs, like I mentioned with your SNAP, using your EBT card, using a, a WIC check, um, for every X amount of dollars you spend, this incentive program builds on top of that. So just for example, if I'm spending two, you get an additional two. So now you have increased your purchasing power, um, which is significant. Uh, so I think that when you look at those barriers of access, transportation, cost, um, you know, and, and the convenience piece that we talked about. Now there's a little bit of a danger or slippery slope on the other side of that. Uh, which I think we need to address because it's not only just the accessibility or the ability to purchase fresh food, it's the knowledge or ability to know how mix, or what yeah. to do with it, mm -hmm. um, how to cook, um, how to keep it, how to preserve or store it, and also the ability to have the means within how to prepare it. So if you don't have gas, right? If you're, you're, you're so tight pinched that some of your utility bills have gone to the wayside. If you don't have a stove, if you only have a microwave, if you don't you know, have pots and pans, or if you don't, you're not cooking like Julia Child, right? So um, you have to take that into consideration as well. So let's say I get my hands on some beautiful you know, produce and I've got some potatoes or some kohlrabi, I've got some beautiful greens, now what? Yeah. What, do, how, what do I do with this? How is it? So um, I think then that's where things like nutrition education, um, education outreach in our community helps. Um, there are great organizations um, that are doing that simultaneously when you see, um, you know, at the farmer's markets, farm stands, food access points. Not only are people getting um, accessibility, uh, but they're also um, able to get the education behind. And I I'm even seeing some some kitchen tools being handed out, like cutting boards, yeah. or you know, I don't think I've ever seen knives handed out. No, um, but you know, strainers <laughs> and you know, recipes, yes, um, bilingual, recipe bicultural, mm -hmm. um, you know, explanations of what this is today, or let me take something that's really um, familiar to you culturally yep. or shelf stable, like a can of beans, or even better, dried beans, uh, you know, and let's talk through what and how to do with them so that it's familiar to you. And that's what you're going to want to do as opposed to what you have to do. Absolutely. And I'm going to give a shout out to the food trusts because they are such a huge, huge cornerstone of the Penn Street market. And exactly what Lucine's talking about, about that nutrition education, like, you know, not last season, but before that hands on, I mean, people and people want to learn, everyone wants to learn. And I think that that, that consumer awareness is an important piece of the puzzle across the board, whether you're in a food insecure urban area, 
or um, you know, if you're in a rural area and you never saw a kohlrabi in your life and you still don't know what to do with it, <laughs> um, it's across the board. Um, so or thank even you. Courtney, can I interrupt just for yes. a second? Because yeah. it also has something I think to do with like age, uh, yes. because I've noticed that there was a, a blip in um, maybe a lack of consumer science or home ec or whatever you want to call yeah. it you know people kind of like forgot how to cook or it wasn't generational I think Michelle started talking about yeah. that and then you know we started to see people ordering pre-made food or getting food in a box you know and and getting instructions on how to make it now and so like there's this been this interesting revolution of like food education or um I don't want to call it homemaking because I don't think that's the right or home studying or just learning knowing how to cook right so yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I think uh, another big piece of that puzzle is people are really recognizing more across the board, no matter where you live or, or your, um, you know, your economic status is that there is a, you can't deny that connection between the nutrition piece and the health. Um, and I think a lot of people are realizing that more. So people are making a more concerted effort to, to do better with what they're eating and to cook more at home and understanding that that's a big piece of it. Um, Michelle, go I ahead. I know you want to, I know you, there's, well, you gotta have something here for it. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm the negative person of the panel, but I, <laughs> That's because I you're the historian, you know, all the mistakes we've made, right? <laughs> I, I don't think people are doing that. I want them to do that. I hope they're doing that. I think there are small examples of it, but for instance, food education and nutrition education. Um, there are a few different schools around the country that are doing things like Edible Schoolyard uh, modeled on Alice Waters program starting in Berkeley where you get kids involved in gardening and growing things and cooking and the life cycle of the insects and the food and everything else. And so it becomes integrated in the curriculum. And that's important and valuable. It is so rare. Um, you get initiatives like Michelle Obama's Changing School Lunches, which had uh, a, an impact briefly. Hopefully it will continue or come back again or whatever, but it was small and there was all this resistance and there were all these people who said, well, the kids don't want vegetables. Well, if you never give them vegetables exactly. and they're not gonna know what to do with them. Um, or if you never give them, you know, fresh meat and they just have a frozen Salisbury steak, I mean, that's what they expect. Right. So, so, you know, I'm, I'm a little more cautious. I don't wanna say pessimistic. I'm very cautious at this point that we have a critical mass of people um, changing their expectations because I think as soon as we start to get a certain amount of um, uh, challenge to the existing system, a lot of those challenges get co-opted. Um, so the single biggest uh, example of that might be um, the co-opting of organic and the creation of industrial organic um, as opposed to a, a genuinely local program or the way um, people have been uncomfortable with our meat production and you have large meat producers that started out as local, humane, everything else, and they've kind of become big conglomerates. And so people might go and buy a Coleman's package of meat and feel like they're doing their part to change the system instead of driving to yeah. Pam's farm. Yeah. And Pam, I know you want to jump in here. And first of all, Risa, I saw you unmuted yourself. Yeah. Is there a question? There is a comment from one of our Facebook listeners. Okay. And, uh, uh, and Jody then Pam, Gawker's, hold your thought. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Jody Gawker says we need... Uh, Jody. Jo yeah, she says we need 4-H food and nutrition for adults. 
like education on on uh, like yeah, the forest programs. That connection with the kids idea. is very <laughs> important, but we can't forget about the adults, right? We said that it's generational. Right, right. Um, so yeah. we can comment I, on that. Honestly, but honestly I, we're just talking about uh, you know generational, uh, and I'm I'm being educated right now by my son and my daughter-in-law who are very particular about what they eat, and they uh, they shop at Whole Foods and they get. CSA deliveries during the pandemic, they found a CSA that actually makes deliveries, which was great. Awesome. And, uh, you know, I've learned a lot from them. We were just down there not too long ago at their house and, and they were telling me how these tiny baby carrots that we eat aren't really natural carrots. <laughs> so, Shave them down. <laughs> I know, it's like, okay, yeah, I should have known that, you know? Uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot for, for my generation to learn from, from I feel young people are, are more tapped into this kind of thing, yeah. Pam, did you wanna add something? So I want Michelle to actually talk about what post-World War II, um, cause my mom bought into TV dinners and not cooking. And um, so the government had a lot to do with post-World War II and switching from making bombs to using it as chemical fertilizer. Yeah. Um, let's. So I want Michelle to address that in a minute. Um, but I want to talk about the co-opting of terms. Um, I belong to um, American Pastured Poultry, the association. And um, it, it's very interesting to get on the forums um, and listen to some of the discussions um, because cage-free eggs, let's go to eggs. Let's just go to, let's just talk about eggs. Case the terminology case. is mind boggling, right? Well, yeah. and, and, and it goes back to people thinking that they're doing good by buying, right. So I agree caged free is better than caged. When you put the, you know, all these birds in a cage and they walk all over each other and it's awful. It's just horrendous. But caged free doesn't necessarily mean pasture raised. Mm -hmm. Like my guy, my girls are on pasture. They eat bugs. I feed them too. They get food because they can't get enough, because um, I don't let them, I can't have them be truly free range or my foxes will just have a field day. So they're contained within electric fences, but it's 362 you know, feet of circular fence around their coops. But they're out, they're walking around, they're eating bugs, they're, that's pasture raised as opposed to pasture access where they're in a confinement building with 100,000 other birds and they have a door to go outside and less than 2% of them will ever go outside because now that's scary to them. Right. Um, and, and the door is not opened until they're a certain number of weeks old. So they never learn to go outside the door anyway. Right, but. right. So, you know, and, and then is that really pasture out there or is it just cement that they can go out and then come back in? So. It's, it's hard because it, I think it's difficult for the, the average consumer to go to the grocery store and understand what these words mean. Absolutely. You know, so I think that the, the difference between local organic food, and I don't care if it's certified or not. If I can look at the farmer and I can ask them the questions. Conversation, right? Start and, that conversation. you know, and especially if I'm at the farm, can I walk around? Can I see what you're doing? Or will you not let me in your building? Because that's where the other stuff is that you don't want me to see, you know? Um, and so when people ask me, I say, just, just ask questions. And if someone can't look you in the face and say, this is how I do it. Give you a straight answer, then maybe find another and, farmer. <laughs> yeah, and and most people, and I also understand that it's very difficult on a, on a national level to have that access. And right. the thing that really surprises me is when you read about, there are food deserts in Iowa. I mean, mm -hmm. we grow so much food in Iowa, but it tends to be corn and soybeans. Yep. Yeah. They're <laughs> you know, not only they, in the cities, have, right? Right. So now you have these people and then the education piece is, is that how do we get the kids to understand that being farmers is, is just as important as being a lawyer? Or a or doctor for that matter. <laughs> or a doctor, you know, it, but the dumb farmer, you know, when people talking about, you don't want to be on a farm. 
all right, I, you, having been in both worlds, you don't make nearly as much money as a farmer. But your lifestyle is very different and the stresses are very different. Um, you become much more in tune with seasons and that kind of stuff. And there's value in that. Absolutely. You know, feeding your family, feeding your neighbors. And, and we had no food insecurity with the pandemic. None. Because I can, I freeze. You know, okay, I, can, I couldn't get lettuce. I don't grow lettuces. But, you know, with the pantry and food security, we were lucky to not feel that like a lot of people did with the pandemic. Absolutely. I, um, I think Pam's comments about um, the, the co-op, co-optation of terms and how we use those terms is um, points to something that I, I did want to make sure we kind of got in since we're thinking about, or I hope that people have a takeaway of, yep. gosh, what can, can I, I do? do? Exactly. Um, that was my next question. To, Thanks, Michelle. To make a difference. Yep. And I think one point I would throw out to people as a takeaway is that you want to do your best but you don't want to be absolutist. So for instance, there's this tension that Pam was just alluding to between local and organic. And in my mind, I think organic is best and local is best and I want it to be the same. If there are things that I get that are not local, like I, go to the store and well, now I've found local flour, but before I found local flour, I went to the supermarket and I bought a sack of flour. It was really important to me that I got organic flour that was certified because I'm not going to trust some anonymous company, you know, to tell me it, it needs to be certified. Now that's not as good as the local flour that now I've found that is produced within Berks County. It's also organic, it, it is certified, but if I had known the farmer, I, I might still get it anyway. So there are other things that I get that aren't certified, but I've gotten to know the farmer or the place. And so I understand the process. So I guess I would encourage people to do your best, make an effort, but don't be so absolute that you have a, a rigid line and then you think um, that only one thing can check the box. That's great, that's great advice. We have three minutes left. Ladies, um, uh, since you're unmuted, Lucene, do you wanna go first? What, what do you think is a good takeaway for our listeners, um, something they can do to make an impact starting today? Well, it's, I have twofold, so I'll try to be brief. Um, sure. One is tune into um, organizations or, you know, uh, local avenues uh, as to where, you know, that education is happening or the accessibility. So, you know, whether it's your 4-H or FFA, whether it's um, barn locally, we have the Berks Agricultural Resource Network. Um, you know, Michelle, I'm happy to say that um, a handful of our school, elementary schools in Reading do have um, gardens um, and, and learning. And yeah, so um, I think try to get connected on a local level um, to the learning and outreach uh, in within the framework of your food system. The other thing I have to say is start to develop a new relationship with food, just you yes. and your food. Um, start to look at it, smell it, talk to it, think about it get to know it um it's going to always take you in the right direction <laughs> yeah what's that food doing for you what, what is that doing for you thank you lucine and pam what do you think your takeaway is for for our listeners oh make sure you unmute we can't hear you pam okay there don't you go. feel bad about where you are we all started with no knowledge Absolutely. and gradually continued to learn more so don't feel bad if you have to go to the corner store and that's where you buy your stuff. Just try to make the best decision you can make and then build on that. That's great. Yeah, and it won't happen overnight, right? It takes time and dedication and, 
and it's a completely learning making process little for small everyone. changes little changes over time absolutely well ladies it has been such a pleasure i want to thank risa for helping out i thank you i wish we had had sure. more questions for you to uh, field but um thank you so much for being I, here i have i have questions <laughs> yeah well i wish we had time you to, know I'll what we can type sorry, them yeah. in and maybe yeah, maybe if any of the ladies Maybe if any of the ladies stick around and you type them in, maybe they'll be able to answer them. But um, did you have something <laughs> else, Lucene? Sorry. I just want to say thank you to you, Courtney, um, oh, for you. organizing and moderating and inviting yeah, all of us uh, to do this. This is really fantastic. It's yeah, been such a, a pleasure. Thank you very, very much. Nice. Thank you, yeah. ladies. I really appreciate you taking the time today and being a part of this conversation. And um, hopefully we'll get some good response from people that view it later. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for being here and uh, enjoy the rest of your Earth Day, ladies. Thank you so much. Take thank care. You. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone.